I invite you to turn in your Bibles to, uh, I think, the most tragic chapter in the Scriptures. Um, my first point is uh, the opportunity, and that's um, it's an understatement that Adam and Eve had the opportunity of a lifetime. They um, were put in a perfect environment with a perfect relationship with each other and a perfect relationship to their Heavenly Father, and... Um, they didn't have to be afraid of wild animals. They didn't have to sweat to uh, make ends meet. Everything was provided. What a golden opportunity they had. Uh, but there was something else, uh, someone else who had an opportunity there too, because where there is freedom, where there is possibility of uh, free choice, the opportunity exists that that free choice might turn out to be a tragic one. And so there was someone else lurking there in the garden who uh, seized this opportunity to tempt our first parents, and uh, thus results, I believe, the, the most tragic chapter in the Bible. A case could be made for um, the execution of our Savior, who was totally innocent, never uh, sinned uh, one moment in his life, and yet he was crucified for our crimes, and certainly that's an injustice. But that wouldn't have been necessary if it wasn't for chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. And so um, with that in mind, I'd like to read it, and uh, probably just to verse 16 uh, today. I am uh, using the New American Standard, so yours might be slightly different in a couple spots, but chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any of the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Verse 4, The serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they, were, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, and there's a series of questions here that we're going to explore in a moment. Verse 9, he said to him, where are you? Um, that's the first question in the Bible, by the way. Um, the first question in the New Testament is, where is he? the one who was born king. But here, God, and he's not searching for information. He already knows the answer. Where are you? And he said, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Next question. <laughs> who told you that you were naked? Next question. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to me with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, next question, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly shall you go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and pain. You shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Uh, Lord willing, we'll take that up uh, next week from verse 17 on. But here um, we want to observe a few things, and uh, let's pray before we do that. Heavenly Father, uh, as hard as it is, thank you that this chapter is in the Bible. Uh, thank you that it explains so much that uh, when people wonder about the cause of evil, people wonder about wildfires and hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanoes and disease and pestilence and violence, when they wonder all those things, we can turn to chapter 3 of Genesis and recognize 
that uh, you are not culpable. You are not responsible for evil in the world. You made a perfect world, perfect parents in a perfect place. They are the ones who chose to rebel. But even though this chapter is so fraught with uh, tragedy, God, there's so much hope in it. And uh, you are seeking these sinners. You want to restore that relationship. You want to restore communion. And as we close out our service in a few moments with communion, God, we want to uh, recognize it is your will to bring people to a place of repentance and restoration and reconciliation. It is your will. You are eager. You're longing to have fellowship with us even more than we long to have it with you. We pray, God, your blessings upon uh, the nursery and the children's church. And uh, our time here, God, as we reflect on this tragedy that um, provides hope in our Lord and Savior's name, amen. (coughs) Well, it's interesting, uh, the series of questions we'll be looking at here, God has some questions for uh, Eve, he has some questions for uh, Adam, and it's because I think he wants to get them to the place of repentance. He wants to get them to the place of actually guilt. And in fact, uh, in counseling, a lot of times, uh, that's what counselors are supposed to do. They listen, they ask questions, and what they're trying to do is get the, the, the client, the, the Christian in particular, to come to a place where they realize and have the same opinion of their sin that God does. And so here he's asking these moral agents, Adam and Eve, questions to lead them into a position of uh, not only shame, they already felt that, he wants to bring them to guilt. Why? So that they would recognize they need to repent and be restored to fellowship with God. He doesn't have those series of questions for the serpent. He doesn't ask him uh, who, what, where, when, and why to the serpent. Why? Because the serpent has already uh, fallen. Satan has already fallen at this time. And the, one, the angels that went with him, one-third of the angels, the book of Revelation tells us, rebelled with him. They have no chance for repentance. Their eternal destiny is locked in, secure. Angels cannot say, oops, uh, following this guy was a mistake. God, let me back in. No, too late. You are confirmed. If you rebelled with Satan, angel, you are confirmed in your wickedness, and there's a place reserved for you. Consequently, the two-thirds of the angels that stayed faithful to God, they can't fall, they can't sin, they are confirmed in righteousness. So there's no series of questions here. God's trying to get to the bottom of this with Satan. I know what you did, and this is what's going to happen to you. In the case of Adam and Eve, God's going to ask a bunch of questions. And again, he's trying to bring them to a place to restore communion. And to not put too fine a point on it, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want you to consider today, is there something in your life that God is not pleased with? Is there someone in your life that you need to be reconciled to? Are you sure, have you nailed down, I am a child of God and I know where I'm going when I die? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and, and in other places too by other authors They urge readers of the Bible, make sure you know you're saved. Make sure you know you're a child of God before you depart uh, this life. So here we have uh, this opportunity. And uh, first of all, we're going to talk about Eve. And uh, a lot of Christians, I've already talked to you about this, uh, the framework hypothesis and some other ideas, theories about why we shouldn't take Genesis 1 through 11 literally. Um, you know, the theological term for it is hogwash. Uh, we, we, want to, uh, we want to believe that God said what he said and did what he did. And this isn't some mythological thing trying to teach us a lesson. How do we know that? Because Uh, The New Testament authors, and in fact, our Lord and Savior Jesus took these opening chapters literally uh, in the New Testament. And so we should interpret Genesis 1 to 11 exactly like they did. These events really happened. We're not sure exactly when. And in fact, I'm not sure, and I don't think anybody else is, how much time has lapsed between Genesis 2.25 
which I spoke on two weeks ago about um, a godly marriage where there's intimacy. They were naked then, by the way, and they weren't ashamed. Everything was cool. But we don't know how long before chapter 3, verse 1. The man and his wife leave his father and mother. They cleave to one another. They become one flesh, and they are naked and not ashamed. There's intimacy. And then we go right into chapter 3, verse 1. We don't know how much time elapsed, but the Satan comes and uh, seizes the opportunity. And so uh, here we have uh, the woman in verse 2. She's responding to Satan's question. Uh, Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And uh, she responds, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. Now there's, we got a problem right? Because in chapter 2, God says, if you eat from that tree, you're going to die. In chapter 3, Satan says, if you eat from that tree, you're not going to die. Hmm, I wonder which one's lying. I would say it's the father of lies, the serpent, who was a murderer from the beginning, and his reason for being there are selfish. He wants to be worshipped and obeyed instead of God. We know that from Isaiah chapter 28 and Ezekiel chapter I think 14, I might have the Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. The fall of Satan is recorded for us. We know his motives. He said, I will ascend to the most high. I want to have my throne above his throne. And so here he is. We don't know how long between the happily uh, ever after man and woman. They're, They're just loving the garden. They're loving each other. They're loving God. We don't know, but here he is. And I would suggest to you, dear ones, when things seem to be going well for you, watch out. Because that's when the enemy might come in and start asking some questions. Verse 3, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Serpent says, no, you won't. Verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's a lie isn't it? In fact, since that time, humans have wanted to be like God. I'm not sure why Adam and Eve would be motivated. They had everything in a perfect environment with a perfect marriage, perfect relationship with God. All their needs were met. They wanted something else. And look what Satan does. He gets them to focus on not all the trees of the garden that you could freely eat, He gets him to focus on the one tree that God says, don't eat it. As we come to communion in a little while, I'm going to encourage you, and and, uh, Elder Marcus Nova will be up here to uh, lead us in that. But I'm going to encourage you to think about, uh, is there something that God has withheld from you and you're mad about it? You think, oh, if he's a good, loving, heavenly father... And uh, all these good gifts, James says, come down from the Heavenly Father. Why has he withheld this one thing? Well, sometimes God withholds good stuff from us. She's going to see here, oh, man, this tree is beautiful. Oh, it's good for food. In fact, the tree isn't the problem. The tree was good. But God said, I'm going to test you. Do you trust me or are you going to do what you want? And all too frequently, we crash and burn because why? We do what we want. We start focusing on the one thing God says, don't, don't have that, but I've given you all this. And instead of being grateful for what we have, we focus on what we don't have. And that's a slippery slope. When the woman saw that the tree was good, verse 6, for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from his fruit and ate. She uh, rebelled willingly, not out of need. You know, sometimes people sin, and you can kind of say, well, they were desperate, and they made a bad choice. There's no desperation here. She's focused because of the serpent's deception. She's focused on the one thing God said you cannot have. And what does she want? The one thing God said she cannot have. 
Maybe something's popping into your mind right now. You say, well, I can relate to that. There's something good that I was dreaming about, and I, I had my heart set on it, and it was a good thing, and God has just closed the door, and I'm mad. Now, a lot of people make a big deal out of this where she said, um, verse 3, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. You've probably heard sermons about that. Oh, she added to the word of God. Well, we're not really sure about that. God may have said, don't touch it. We just don't have that recorded. He says, don't eat it for sure. And uh, she is, uh, a lot of people say, well, she's adding to the word of God. I'm more concerned what she has left out, not what she has put in. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat. You know what she left out? The word any. She should have realized there's an abundance here. God said in chapter 2, verse 16, and he said it to Adam. We're trusting that Adam communicated that to her, but maybe not uh, as clear as we want or is not as forceful. But uh, the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, except. She's focused on the exception instead of the abundant supply God has given us. A lot of us focus on, uh, well, the, the one thing I don't have. You know, consider it, child of God, how crazy rich we are. You know, I was thinking, like a lot of you guys, perhaps, uh, we were out of town and, and couldn't salvage our freezer full of food. And, uh, you know, uh, but Julie and I reminded ourselves, each other, we are so thankful we have a home to come home to. Yeah, we lost some stuff that can be replaced. Uh, we have families here that lost loved ones that will never be replaced. We have people who lost a heck of a lot more than we did in two fires. But Satan wants to whisper into our ears, yeah, but you know, you just stocked your freezer. You're just getting ready for this and get ready for that. And look what you lost. I would rather focus on what I have. I think that pleases God. But Eve, she's focusing on what she doesn't have. So uh, notice here, she recognized the provisions of God. <clears throat> uh, From the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. She left out the word any, and some translations uh, have the word freely. We can freely eat, but she understands. She's not uh, in the dark here. God has provided everything we need. Another thing she recognized, the prohibitions. <clears throat> Don't eat from that tree. Uh, there's no question on which tree God was uh, talking about. Adam and Eve knew it. She knew it. She was aware of it. She not only knew God's provisions, she knew God's prohibitions. You can freely eat of any tree except that one. And then third, Eve uh, recognized the parameters. Um, verse 3, towards the end, uh, you will die. She recognized uh, the penalty, death. And Satan came along and said, no, you won't. And she believed him. She was focusing on what she didn't have. She was focusing on the liar before her instead of her husband, instead of her God, instead of her surrounding. Instead of what she knew to be true, she's focusing on the liar in front of her. <clears throat> now, there's no doubt she was deceived. Paul says this, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a wrongdoer. Paul says it twice. He says it in 2 Corinthians also. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to God. Warning here, it's possible today, New Testament, to still be um, attacked, persuaded, lied to by our enemy. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, to be wise to his uh, uh, schemes. He is powerful. He should not be uh, mocked, but he shouldn't be listened to either. And the minute she recognized, oh, God said, I will die, 
this animal says, I won't. Who are you going to believe? Well, that underscores the importance for us. You better know God's word. So you know what he has said about lots of stuff. Because if you don't know God's word and what he has said about lots of stuff, it is more easy for you to be deceived. And deception will cost you dearly. They died, God said, in the day you eat from that, the day. Same word as all these six days. The day that you eat from that, you will die. Well, they didn't die physically, so they must have died some other way. Bingo. They died spiritually. Separated from God, that's what death is in the Bible. It's never ceasing to exist, ever. Death is always separation. When I die physically, my spirit is separated from my body. When I die spiritually, I'm separated from God. When I sin, I am separated. The communion is broken, and it needs to be restored. And so here comes God. As was his habit, evidently, he came down into the garden in the cool of the evening, and he's walking. He wants to have fellowship, and it's not there. He knows why. He's not here looking for information. He's looking for Adam to respond, to man up and say, yes, I sinned, sorry. But oh no, he justifies, he, he accuses, he, in fact, he accuses God. It was that woman that you gave me. So in, in case you don't buy the first part, it was her fault. Uh, it's ultimately your fault, God. You said it was not good for me to be alone, and you gave me a defective woman. <laughs> Maybe he thought, get rid of her, give me another one. I'm not sure. But it says in verse 6, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Uh, it doesn't say he was deceived. He was a willing participant, a rebel. And a lot of people say, well, you know, he was a, he was a hero. She, she sinned, and so out of his love for Eve, he sinned so he would be with her. Um, Adam is not a hero. Adam is a rebel. And in fact, isn't it interesting when you talk about the heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11, Adam ain't there. His descendants is when they first started to call upon God, and they're in Hebrews chapter 11, but Adam and Eve aren't there. I'm not sure how much we can read into that, but I fear for our first parents. I wonder. The fall as such was nothing less in character than an entirely inexcusable piece of rebellion. I put this in your notes so you don't have to write this down. I think it's in there. A very gracious father who not only had withheld nothing good from man, but had even bestowed such an overwhelming wealth of good things that revolt against such a one must in the very nature of the case be a sin of the deepest hue. Even the one great sin in the history of the human race. This sin in verse 6, the second part of it, she gave also to her husband and he ate, is written in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Because of Adam's sin, death passed to the entire human race. We just recently had a grandson, you might have heard. And uh, as much as I love that little fella, um, he's got a sin nature. And it came from his parents, which came from their parents. And all the way back to Adam and Eve. Adam is our first father, and that death passes down through the generations, through uh, traducianism is the term for it. The material part of man and the immaterial part of man come from the parents, and that includes the sin nature. So Lincoln doesn't have to do anything against God's word or will to be lost. He already is. God's gracious and gives some time for uh, little children to grow up and ponder things. And I think there's something as a, the age of accountability. But Lincoln was born with a sin nature. 
So were you, and so were I. Why is that, why, uh, why is that the case? Because Adam, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Adam, not Eve. Horrible sin. One great sin in history of the human race, Leopold said. Well, uh, what did she experience in this process, verse 6 and 7? The same thing that goes on uh, for us in 1 John chapter 2. The same struggles. The, flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are all um, our enemies. You know, a lot of people, when they sin, they make a bad choice, they do something wrong. Oh, they cast somebody else under the bus. It was uh, my wife, or it was my parents, or it was my kids, or it was my boss, or it was my, uh, uh, my employer, my, my, my first parents, it, or it was Satan. No, it's you. You are the sinner that God wants to restore to communion and fellowship. And thankfully, I, I hope everybody in here has received Christ as their Savior. And so you are in a position where that restoration can take place in the blink of an eye. Just admit your sin and receive God's grace and be restored. And if you haven't received Christ as your Savior, then uh, you've got a step to take before you participate in communion. But you can take care of that today. Acknowledge you're a sinner. Acknowledge that he died for your sins and receive him as your Savior by faith. And you can participate on a whole different level in communion with God. He desires it. He wants to spend time with you in fellowship. He went looking for these guys in the garden. Why? Not to condemn them, to restore them. First John, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away. Did you know that? The world is passing away. And also it's lusts, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. I don't know if it's just me, or maybe you guys notice it too, but uh, evil <laughs> is becoming much more visible and in your face, and uh, it's gaining momentum. Where we were told there will be people who call good evil and evil good, they're here. They're here. I just found out this week. I didn't know it. Disney is producing a, an adult cartoon series called The Little Demon. And the mother of this young girl calls her the Antichrist. And so the rest of the movie is about her exercising her evil powers. And they, they mock Christians. They mock churches. They mock God. Isn't Disney the corporation that used to be family-friendly? Didn't we used to get a chuckle out of Mickey Mouse? Uh, they've changed. Have you noticed? And they're not the only ones. Evil is rampant. Why? Because people are believing the lies. Satan came up with a doozy here. Uh, you're not going to die, but you will be like God. And oh, by the way, you're going to know good and evil. They already knew that. And how in the world could Adam <laughs> recognize, I need a helper, and God provided this helper in Eve, and then think, well, I could be like God. No, you're just a creature. You will never be like God. I know there's some religions that say, we're going to be like God someday, and we're going to be able to do this and do that. No, it isn't true. That's a lie. You'll never be like God in his divine attributes his non-communicable attributes. You will never be omniscient. You're never going to be omnipresent. You'll never be omnipotent. Never. But you'll be like his son, Jesus. And that sounds like a pretty good thing to me. So he's asking these questions. First one, where are you? Uh, verse 9. It's like, uh, have you seen this uh, news thing here? Uh, Jesse Shawan, he's on the job working in an excavator. The cops show up. 
He's got a, a bunch of warrants for his arrest. He's a, a car thief. He's this, that, and the other. He's expected of all kinds of stuff. Hey, Shawin, come here. And what does he do? He presses the accelerator in his excavator. Tries to get away. It goes, what, like three miles an hour? The cops are saying, we see you, Sean. Come here. We could do this the hard way or we could do this the easy way. And it took him three miles before he finally said, okay, I give up. That's how stupid it is to try to hide from God. Adam, they felt shame. And I don't know why. I, I mean, figure this out. Because I was naked, verse 10. Well, God knew that. When God made him, he was naked. And in verse 25 of chapter 2, they weren't ashamed. Now they're naked and ashamed, so he hides himself. And guess what? God can find you. In fact, God is on a mission to find you. Why? He wants restored fellowship. This idiot, you know, he should have been on the dumb criminals video or something. Uh, no, I'm not going to let you arrest me. I'm going to cut away at three miles an hour and pretend I can get away. Well, this guy who looks a little portly is keeping up with him. And he's got a badge, he's got a gun, he's got a warrant. So, uh, the, you know, it's, it's all up, guy. Give up. You think you're hiding from God? God is everywhere. In fact, check out this scripture. You have encircled me behind and in front and placed your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot comprehend it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? You might as well hop on an excavator and try and get away at three miles an hour than to try to hide from God. He knows where you are. He knows what you've done. He wants to restore you. That's why he's asking this, these questions. Where are you? And then the second one is, who told you you were naked? Verse 11. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? What's he looking for here? He's looking for Adam to fess up. He's not looking for information. God already knows it. He's looking for confession. He's looking for, yes, God, I blew it. I'm sorry. I'm going to claim your forgiveness. And then God will say, great, come on back. If you're here today and you feel estranged from God, he's, he's pursuing you. He knows where you are. He knows what you've done. He knows what you're hiding. Everything is open to God. What's he doing? He's inviting. Just recognize your sin as I do. Confess it and repent and come back. Let's get back on track. The last one, what have you done? Verse 13. Um, this was to the woman. What is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. Well, that's true, but he didn't make you eat. You knew all of this stuff, God's provisions, God's prohibitions, God's parameters, God's penalty. You knew all that stuff. Don't claim stupidity. Don't claim ignorance. Just fess up. And then he gets all these questions directed at Adam, and then this one to Eve. What is this that you have done? <clears throat> now, I want you to recognize something here. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of Christians who um, believe that this spiritual death that they experienced, obviously, they didn't die physically that day. They began to die. It took about 900 years for Adam to die, but uh, he no longer had a perfect eternal life. And in fact, uh, part of the judgment was, I'm not going to let you go back into the garden, so I'm going to put my angel there with a flaming sword. Why? So you won't eat of the fruit of that other tree that will give you eternal life in a lost state. That's why we get this little clue here with Satan. God doesn't ask Satan a bunch of questions. Why? Because Satan's doom is sure. If Adam would have gone back in to eat from the tree of, of life, he would have been locked into a lost state forever. So God said, you ain't going back in there. I'm going to put my angel there to guard. And what happens here is that uh, Adam 
is uh, justifying his behavior. He feels shame. He feels nakedness. He is estranged from his wife, but he's hearing the voice of God. He's responding. So these people who believe spiritual death means that my spirit no, does not exist until God gives me a spirit is theologically suspect. There are people who believe, we call them Calvinists, if you want me to put a title on this, that you have to be regenerated by God before you can believe. Why? Because you're spiritually dead. You can't respond spiritually until God gives you new life. Well, these guys were spiritually dead, and they were responding to God. He was asking them a series of questions, and they gave the right responses. Oh, it's her fault, his fault, somebody else's fault. They're trying to justify. They're feeling guilty. They're feeling shame. They're hearing his voice. That doesn't sound like a, a person that is so dead that they cannot respond in faith. There are some people who believe God made people, some people, for no other purpose than for them to burn in hell. I don't believe that's what the Bible says. Jesus Christ died for the sins of all mankind. And if you respond in faith, that's when regeneration takes place. Regeneration does not precede faith. It's the other way around. We are invited in the Bible in a million places. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. There are some people who got it backwards. You're saved and then you trust God. That's not what the Bible says. The eyes of both of them were opened. They knew what, that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. They tried to take things into their own hands and cover up. They made uh, for themselves coverings. Why? Because they felt shame in their spirit. They felt this, uh, this shame, this embarrassment is not physical because in verse 25, they were naked and they were not ashamed. So something happened in this transaction of sin and disobedience that gave them awareness of a spiritual death. They hid themselves. They tried to cover up. They blamed somebody else. They heard his questions. They, heard, they gave him uh, answers, none of which he wanted to hear. Why? Because in their spiritual death, they still felt guilt. And guilt is a good thing if you allow Jesus Christ to take it from you. Guilt leads you to repentance from shame, embarrassment, uh, broken fellowship with each other, with your spouses, with your God, with people in the church perhaps. All of that can be repaired by repenting and getting back in uh, communion with God. Well, here's some of the results. We're not going to give all of them today. We'll touch on some of this. It's interesting. The seed will be at enmity with the woman's seed. Um, I made reference to that Disney movie about um, this woman having sex with the devil and producing the Antichrist. I think it's right here in Genesis chapter 3, 15, and 16. I will put enmity between you and the woman. So you, the serpent, uh, Satan. The woman is Eve and her descendants between your seed and her seed. Well, we know the woman is literal. We know the serpent's literal. We know her seed is literal. Well, if his seed is literal in that same context, that's the Antichrist we're talking about. The woman will long or ache for her husband. Uh, we'll look at the problems that Adam brought upon himself here in a little while, but um, when you find yourself in shame or embarrassment, guilt, Instead of running away from God, run to God. That's what he's looking for. The questions urge confession. Where are you? Uh, who told you? What have you done? Those are to elicit a response of humble repentance and not condemnation. God's motive is restoration of communion, 
not eternal separation. He protected them from that. He put the sword there with the angel. Don't go back in there. That's at the end of chapter 3, verse 24. Why? Because I don't want you to eat that fruit and be forever separated from me. And there's people in this room, perhaps, you've not responded to Jesus Christ in faith yet and received him. God wants, that's his will. He wants you to respond because he doesn't want you to be separated from him forever. Death is separation. The second death, Romans 6.23, is eternal damnation. No coming back from hell. That doesn't have to be. God offers himself, and he is asking questions. Repent, come back, be restored. Let's have fellowship. Let's have communion. And that's a good place to start um, our communion service right now. Uh, I don't want this to be just a tacked-on exercise that we do once a month, and we missed it last week, so let's do it again. No, this is vitally important. From the most tragic chapter in the Bible to the end when we see Jesus face to face, it's all about communion and, and getting into God's presence and doing God's will and feeling his, um, his joy in your life. So, um, Elder Marcus, if you would come up, please, and uh, lead us in communion.